Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Lynch. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. Prior to that, I had a long career both as the, um, as the Cancer Center Director at, at uh, the Yale Cancer Center in New Haven, and prior to that, Chief of Hemonc at Mass General Hospital and worked at Partners for years. So I want to thank Chris for the opportunity to come back and really focus on something incredibly important. And I, I, in Charlie's talk, I, I'm reminded of one key fact. The last time I was in this ballroom with Governor Baker was the first dinner of the Kenneth B. Schwartz Center. And the Kenneth B. Schwartz Center is a group in Massachusetts dedicated to enhancing the connection between patients and caregivers. And say, so why would I mention that? I'd mention that for the same reason that Charlie mentioned the importance of patients at the heart of what we're doing in clinical research. Because ultimately, that's what today's session is going to be about. It's going to be about finding ways to use technology to enhance and fix our clinical trial system. And why are we doing that? We're doing that because of children with sickle cell disease at Children's Hospital, people with cancer at Mass General and Dana-Farber and Beth Israel and Boston University. Chris, I hope I've been politically correct and covered all the hospitals in the system, Tufts as well. Um, that these are all reasons that we do all the things we do. I want to start off with another point. Having been a cancer center director and now being in pharma, I can tell you that the clinical trial system is equally broken on both sides, okay? <laughs> There are no heroes who are fixing it from the pharma side or the university side. We need to find ways to get our trials done quicker, more efficiently, and to find out whether our treatments are safe and effective. And now, what's the promise of how we can do that? And today, we'll be talking about real-world evidence generation and how do we optimize clinical trials in the era of artificial intelligence. We have a great panel who's gonna be able to answer many of these questions. We have Amy Abernethy, who's currently the Deputy Director of the FDA. She's also the Chief Information Officer of the FDA. Uh, prior to that, she was at Flatiron, so has really done a lot of things in the real world evidence uh, standpoint. Michael DeVoy, who's Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Bayer. Uh, Josh Mendel, Chief Architect of Microsoft Healthcare, Vicki Seifert Margolis, who's the CEO of My Own Med, and Stephen uh, Wiviot, who's the Executive Director of the Clinical Trials Office um, at Partners Healthcare, a cardiologist at the Brigham Women's Hospital, and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. So, what I'd like to do is start off the panel, and the other key thing is I've been told that we have access to questions that can come in uh, via uh, the iPad. I would ask you uh, to please use this. As everyone knows, we have better panels when they're interactive panels. If this is anything like an all-employee meeting in pharma, no one ever asks good questions, but they put incredibly hard questions to answer on the iPads, okay? <laughs> So they won't want to say it, but if you put it on the iPad, we'll try to answer them the best we can. I'd like to ask each of you just to start off by giving us, by introducing yourselves, but then also talking a little bit about how you would answer the potential of, of trial optimization AI. Is it hype? Is it hope? Is this a way we can try to fix this system? Thanks, Tom. So um, when we were chatting, you said uh, before the panel started, it's good if we disagree a lot. But uh, for your opening words, it's hard to disagree. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Bayer. I'm responsible also for all our real-world evidence in our uh, pharmaceutical business. I also wear an interesting hat that uh, takes me across all the divisions Bayer has, including our crop and consumer health as well. And we certainly have some big challenges in terms of clinical trials, as you say, both from the academic and the industry perspective. And I believe really strongly that data the application of artificial intelligence is something that's going to help us solve that problem and take us forward. But I also see enormous challenges to get there. I think also we're seeing a transition, certainly in uh, healthcare and pharma and device companies. We're becoming not just science companies, but also data companies as we go forward. I also believe that uh, we need to partner a lot more to make these things happen. That, uh, 
certainly at Bayer, we're trying to build all sorts of partnerships to get access to the right data, the right technology, the right solutions, the right intellectual capacity to help us bring these solutions forward. Uh, Bayer is uh, very active in a number of therapeutic areas, including oncology and cardiovascular. And we see enormous challenges in bringing new therapies in cardiovascular unless we look at different and innovative ways of bringing products. And just to finish, and really resonating what uh, Governor Baker said, we have to do this in a way that empowers physicians and most importantly puts patients at the center of this whole discussion. So the technology in the end is just going to be the facilitator to how we really put patients at the center of this. Hi, Amy Abernathy. I'm an oncologist by background. I was a professor of medicine at Duke and ran the Center for Learning Healthcare before I went to Flatiron Health, where I was chief medical and chief scientific officer. And now I've made a, another about face um, to join the FDA as the principal deputy commissioner and acting CIO. Uh, I absolutely believe in a landscape where real world evidence and better data can help us optimize clinical trials. It may take us a while to get there. In the near term, I anticipate that we can use better data to help us with recruitment, to help us with trial optimization in the context especially of day-to-day -day operations. In the midterm, I anticipate that we're going to be able to use real-world evidence as a complement to traditional clinical trials and also learn how to use real-world evidence to support tasks that traditional clinical trials have previously been taken care of. But in the future, just like Charlie uh, Baker said, we've got a responsibility to get it right and be thoughtful about how we use AI across our clinical trials landscape, taking place as certain aspects that we currently conduct clinical trials. So I want to talk a little bit about inputs and outputs in this process. Overall, I think that, that there's a lot for us to learn about the places where real world evidence, where access to data can make a difference in the clinical trial space. But there's a lot of inputs that we're still missing today, even to be able to explore. Uh, and so what I want to convince you of, first of all, is the kinds of information we need as inputs are not going to be valuable just for exploring trial optimization and the application of real world evidence uh, in this space. But they're going to be the kinds of things that are useful for general clinical care, understanding best practices and taking care of populations. So these are the kinds of things like data flows. How do we access structured and unstructured health record information that comes from inside of the EHRs that we've got deployed today inside of our clinical organizations? How do we integrate tools back into the workflow so we can collect additional data where we need it um, so that we can ping and notify when things happen inside of a clinical environment? These are all the basic building blocks that are gonna, that are gonna apply both to general care and to being able to build more robust and adaptive kinds of trial designs. So that's a lot on the input side about some of the groundwork that we still need to lay. Uh, and I think that no matter what happens on the other side, there's gonna be immense clinical and care benefits, uh, even just to understanding the variation in care as it exists today. We're not in place to do that yet, and we don't have the right organizational structures. We need a lot of work to make sure that clinical organizations can share data, they've got the right data use agreements and the right kinds of culture in place to be able to share, not just for clinical care, but also for research. On the output side, this is a place where I am cautiously optimistic. What are the algorithms going to be that, we're go that will apply in the real world? There are well-known, really exciting opportunities to do things that e seem to even surpass human performance on the one hand, at tasks that can be repeated over and over again. So there's a lot of reason to be excited on that front. But there are also spectacular failure modes for these kinds of uh, AI interventions. And we need to understand <coughs> the places where they're both systematically biased in terms of not having been trained on the right populations, on the right kinds of data, but also the places where they'll just randomly or almost inexplicably fail. We've got a lot to learn, but I'm overall quite hopeful that if we've got the groundwork laid, uh, we'll start to ask the right questions and, and build up the right kinds of algorithms. Hi, so I'm Vicki Seifert-Margolis. I'm an immunologist by training, and I like to think in systems. And I think my career has really been uh, a, a transition around how to drive innovation in clinical trials. So I had the honor of working for uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci a long time ago at NIAID, and I moved into a, a very unique role back in 2000 where we were doing biomarker discoveries integrated into phase two and phase three trials. I was the CSO of a large public-private partnership. We did this for autoimmune disease, allergy, asthma, solid organ transplantation. And at the time, this idea of doing longitudinal data capture and integrating in biomarker discovery was quite novel. And one of the frustrations we had was, wow, we can find these sort of snapshots of people across the time continuum. And 
we could understand a little bit about what's going on with the biology, but we didn't have good clinical correlates. And where we were really missing good clinical correlates was what was happening with the patient between those visits, even in a clinical trial. So we know there's so much action, particularly in symptomatic or syndromic diseases, for example, CNS, mental health, autoimmune diseases, we're missing big pieces of information, particularly information about what the patient experiences. And I think this is a critically important component of what we need to explore. Because not only does it give us a better view of what's going on with the patient between visit, it gives us a view or an ability to look for early signs and symptoms that allow us to do things like event-driven sampling. It also, I think, is a very important component of giving people a voice. I have spent countless times in meetings with physicians in academic medical centers, in community-based practices, and I work both in poor, poor Medicaid populations, like in Brownsville, Texas, and I work with top-tier medical institutions and pharmaceutical companies. And I think one of the, the struggles that I see in all of this is respecting that patient-centeredness, because I've heard time and time again from physicians, but the patients don't give us reliable information. And I think, I think that we really have to find ways to use these tools to get that reliable information from patients, merge it with electronic medical record data and objective measures to get the complete picture of what is the journey of the patient, how do we define subpopulations, and how do we use our new therapies in these discrete subpopulations and across that continuum of care. And that's where I really feel like these technologies will, will open up insights and in, in a new type of trial. Okay, uh, so hi, I'm Steve Wiviat. I'm a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's. Uh, I'm an uh, active card-carrying uh, clinical trialist. Um, I spend about half of my time doing uh, clinical trials uh, research. You know, I think I agree with what I've heard from a number of the folks up here that in many senses, the clinical trial system is broken, that uh, we, in order to um, answer relatively straightforward questions, uh, we are uh, having to create incredibly large consortia of, uh, of people. We're spending you know, hundreds of millions or half a billion dollars to run a, a simple clinical trial with a yes-no answer in many senses. Uh, and sometimes we're running those trials when we already know the answers, but we have to do it again because it's a slightly different uh, molecule or it's run by, by a slightly different sponsor. So I think there's a lot of places that we can use uh, technology, that we can use some of this evidence. Uh, and I agree with what, what Amy said about trying to find ways that we can streamline trials, that we can make them more efficient <coughs> and more effective. But I do want to make, uh, I think, what's an important point, particularly for the people who um, you know, are not uh, uh, clinical researchers or are not uh, clinician scientists, is that there, there is a, a sense out there that um, real world ev evidence can somehow replace uh, randomized clinical trials. And I think we have seen that over and over again um, that there have been uh, observational studies uh, where we try to compare therapies. And what we do is we can have a very large study that shows uh, a very clear confounded signal um, with great precision. So I think that, uh, you know, like the, the concept of, you know, naming things, real world evidence sounds really great because it's real and it's out in the world and that's where the patients are. Um, but I, you know, I saw a cartoon recently that talked about anti-vaxxers and that maybe we should call those people pro-plague, <laughs> right? So I would say instead of uh, saying you know, clinical trials are not as good because they're not real, clinical trials are real, but we need to figure out where, where the data um, works the best. Terrific, and we've, the good news is we've already got two questions in. We will get to those. I have a couple for the group to start with. Um, and I want to start with Josh, okay? Because, uh, Josh, you're both a physician and you're an architect. By architect, I assume they mean that you understand software and databases and how things relate to each other. I hope that's right. Okay, all right. <laughs> Excellent. So I guess the question I'll ask you is, give me an example where artificial intelligence has made a difference in clinical trials. A real world example. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm pausing because this is honestly a bit outside my domain. I spent a lot of time thinking about using, for example, structured inclusion and exclusion criteria from clinicaltrials.gov, thinking about consumer facing tools to help individuals <laughs> join a study. Uh, often these are, oftentimes these are observational studies. So, you know, for example, um, 
the work that I've been doing has been laying out many of the input data coming into uh, research studies that individuals might want to donate their own health information to. So I, I'm, I'm going to hesitate not because I can't point to an example having been steeped in the domain, but because from outside the domain, I don't have so, a ready one at hand. So Chris Coburn has designed two years of forums around artificial intelligence making a difference in healthcare. Okay, and you, who clearly are an expert, can't give me an example of one where it's made a difference in clinical research. <laughs> To put a finer point on, on my negative answer, though, it's, it's not about the field. It's about my experience, which has been on the health interoperability side. My focus has mostly been unlocking data from inside of health record systems rather than working on clinical research. And, and the reason I asked you the question is I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think you're actually, that's been my experience as well. So I'm going to ask the same question to Vicky. Give me an example of where AI has informed um, clinical or has, has, has facilitated clinical trial design or clinical trial implementation or thoughts about a clinical trial or dreams about a clinical trial? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it's reached clinical trials yet. Okay. And, and I agree with you. I don't think we should be thinking about real world evidence as replacing randomized control trials. I think <clears throat> they are augmenting and should be run in parallel. The only thing I would say is I have seen some use of image reading instead of going to a central, you know, a central third party reader, which, which may be um, a way to improve clinical trials. But with respect to design, no, nothing. Amy? So, so I'm going to disagree. Um, and I'm speaking not specifically as the FDA, but as a person who's been working in clinical trials, clinical trial optimization, and AI for a very long time. And so first of all, I'd like to argue that you know, if we go to last year's um, forum de definition of AI, we were talking broadly about computational methods as, as applied within the clinical trial space. And I think we've got three really practical examples. We've got the use of algorithms to now support risk-based monitoring and identify um, areas that where we should uh, basically focus monitoring resources. Now, that activity has been demonstrated to be uh, quite doable. <laughs> the take up across the industry is um, you know, questionable, but certainly the FDA has been pushing that conversation forward. The second example is we've got now examples of um, basically drug approvals that have used real world data as the control arm. So um, one was an Amgen drug that was approved several years ago and an aggregation of data now as the comparator um, against a, uh, the for the evaluation of a drug that was evaluated in a single arm study. And, and then the third example is there are a number of uh, vendors who are now doing work that demonstrate the increased enrollment by targeting clinical trial recruitment resources based on algorithms to patients who are most likely to be eligible for a trial. So I think we do have places where computational methods are making a difference. Could I, Vicky, could I oh yeah, please. Thing? I, I agree with you. I would say that, that those are absolutely the case and that there definitely have been a number of trials starting in rare diseases where um, virtual controls, for example, have been used out of data mining. I don't know whether that's AI. Yeah, so that's-, that's and, and, and so my, what I seem to experience yeah. is that no matter what, particularly in the industry, people are going back to statistics. Um, and you know, I, don't, I, I agree there's algorithms running, there's optimization for patient recruitment. But I don't know if it's taken a firm hold yet in, in design. I mean, there's still even aversion to doing adaptive study designs and, and Bayesian statistics in, in many of the industry-sponsored trials. So, I, so, so that's my point. I so guess So Michael, slow. you're the chief medical officer of one of the big yeah. pharma companies in the world and doing incredibly important work. Do you use AI in your daily life? Is it part of the way you think about study trial design when you have your committees get together and approve clinical trials? How often are AI-driven aids used in, in your decision making? Not, not at the moment. It's more discussions we have about the potential. So I'd say we are, we are using practically the things that Amy talked about in terms of developing control arms in rare diseases and indications where it wouldn't be ethical to have a placebo arm. We have AI now applied to a, not to a clinical trial, but actually to a diagnostic problem, so CTEF, so this condition where you get uh, chronic thrombotic embolic pulmonary hypertension, where it's often missed even by experienced radiologists because it's, the patients present with nonspecific pulmonary symptoms, 
the CT scans uh, pulmon, um, are not very specific, so we're actually now applying and are working with the FDA to develop something that will improve the diagnostic sensitivity there. But day to day, are we? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so Steve, I think what you're hearing from the group so far has been a yeah. little bit of a distinction between AI versus real world evidence. And so while I might share a little bit of skepticism that we have AI driving much of what we do, I am not skeptical about real world evidence. What do you think the difference between quote unquote AI and quote unquote real world evidence is? And how should we think of them? Yeah, so I, well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I guess I would say that, um, that real world evidence in many senses is the use of um, observational data um, to uh, try to uh, develop uh, information uh, about how um, diseases behave, about how people, um, uh, you know, how people treat, uh, treat diseases. Um, I think that um, the, the evidence that comes from these, um, these sources can be combined uh, with other traditional types of sources in order to accomplish some of the kinds of things that you get from, uh, from clinical trials. Um, but I think the concept is that it's, you know, what's happening out in the world. Now there are, you know, I think one of the things that we're getting caught up in on the panel, unfortunately a little bit, is just really nomenclature, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we all would agree, um, you know, that we shouldn't use observational data to make causal inferences. Um, I think we would also agree um, that there is computation that is being done uh, and that there is, you know, that we are using pattern recognition to serve uh, certain aspects of, uh, you know, of making clinical trials more efficient. You know, and I think one, the best example, or one of the big best examples is, um, is what, what Amy raised around, around monitoring. I mean, you have, you know, people traveling the world to look at what other people are doing. Um, and they, they come in, they look at, you know, a, a source document, they compare it to a case record form. And it takes you know, hundreds or thousands, or in cases of some of these big trials, you know, tens of thousands of hours of, of uh, high cost labor, and they really don't find anything because they don't have the big picture. Whereas if you, you, know, you are able to run algorithms that can look for things that shouldn't be happening, there shouldn't be um, the same heart rate in many, <coughs> in many patients across one, one site on, on EKGs, or there shouldn't be the same last digit on um, all the, the laboratory tests. Those things actually find the, the real problems in clinical trials when people are making up data or where there are you know, really major issues. So I think we would agree, I think many of us would agree that computational work is being done and that real world evidence is being used in good ways, but I think we're getting a little bit tied up in what it is. Agreed. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in, and so I think we're going to have to do a, get, have a couple of these because I think they, be, they would uh, lead to some good discussion here. And the first question I'm going to ask uh, it will be to will be to Josh because Josh, you're the first person who I can't imagine has an angle on this answer. Okay. Um, yeah, the rest of us have a clear angle in answering it this way. Okay, which is are non-randomized trials suitable to perform treatment comparisons? Okay. Gosh. I, I mean, I do have a personal perspective on this one, uh, and, and they're not. Well, a personal perspective is better than an angle. <laughs> right. I mean, I, it's, it's coming from an angle. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's not my job. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the thing we can say. I, no, I think that over and over, we wind up surprising ourselves with all the ways in which observational findings turn out not to hold up when you ask the question in a really precise way. And when you recruit in a way that you decided ahead of time and, and where you randomize participation. Um, I, I do hope that we'll over time be able to limit the number of, of participants you need in a study like this and the expense of running the studies. It's hard for me to imagine how we get beyond that basic modality. And Steve? Yeah, no, I was just going to make a, a quick point, is which, you know, I think you would almost certainly expect me to say no, um, that you can't, you know, you can't replace randomized trials by uh, observational comparisons. But there are times where it actually makes a lot of sense, right? If you have, you know, for instance, if you have, um, you know, one of the diseases that, it, that Amy was treating that had a, a, a uniform outcome, you could identify a population of patients, you know exactly what's going to happen to them, you know, pancreatic cancer that, it, that's advanced. You don't really need a control group to know if you have a, an effective therapy in that, in that setting. 
You know, so if you're able to identify a population, if you're able to know the markers that clearly predict the outcomes, then you don't need it. But for the kinds of things that, that we're doing now, um, looking at you know, congestive heart failure outcomes, coronary artery disease outcomes, diabetes outcomes, where you know, a lot more depends on who you are than what you take, uh, then you really do need the control. So, so this is a question for Vicki and Josh to think about. I recently went through an exercise with some consultants from McKinsey who were trying to understand culture uh, of, of, of Bristol Myers. And so they sat down and the way they said we want to understand culture, we don't want to talk to you about it. We're going to give you this playing, this deck of playing cards. And I'm sorry if there's any McKinsey partners in the room. It was actually pretty effective and it was used as a way to quantify how I thought of different cultural elements. And so Vicki, what I'm struck by is your comments about patient reported outcomes and patient perspectives. One of the things as we think about hard outcomes in clinical trials is how do we quantify them? How do we give them data integrity? How do we take things that might be considered soft and make them hard? Uh, McKinsey did it with a deck of cards. How do you think we'll be doing it in the future in terms of gathering information about new therapies? And Josh, I'd be curious about your opinion about that as well. Yes, I think this is really important because in so many of the diseases where I've worked historically, when you look at the endpoints, um, they tend to be scales. You know, take rheumatoid arthritis or take, you know, uh, many of the autoimmune diseases, take pain. They tend to be scales that are evaluated, certainly psychosocial or mental health as well, evaluated in an interview setting or a set of questions or surveys at, at an engagement point within a clinic. And we are doing approvals based on those scales. And I think there's often information missing or, um, again, about what's happening between those evaluations. And I think that the questions um, and the scales are often framed to diagnose a disease, not necessarily to look for a change in outcome from baseline. So I've been doing uh, work with one of the leading Alzheimer's researchers right now. And we're looking at the, the standard questions that are asked to diagnose Alzheimer's and saying, okay, how do we apply that to an actual change in outcome when the outcomes that the patient experiences or that the spouse observes are often changes in lifestyle functions. So I think we need to look at how do we begin to correlate and validate some of those other lifestyle functions to some of these scales that we have that are the quote unquote gold standards because even some of those gold standards may not you know, be as hard of an outcome as, as we think now. So, so Josh, how do we quantify and measure thoughts and feelings? <laughs> oh. so the, I mean, the thing that I might tack onto this is, is starting to marry some of this perspective with the kinds of things that we, we do know how to measure and we're increasingly incidentally measuring for lots of reasons. Um, so, you know, from the perspective of activities of daily living, these are the kinds of, of things that you could sit down and ask somebody a multi-pointed questionnaire about several times a day, um, or you could start to develop predictions of, of how somebody is doing with those activities based on uh, their physical movements, based on the number of places they visit, uh, from some of the examples that we heard this morning based on um, the vocal qualities that you could get from a microphone interaction. So I, I think that- Or mobility, oh, right? Mobility, mobility you're, you're, you're pairing a phone, you've got a device. Things. Yeah, and, and sorry that I didn't say that clearly. Yeah. When I talk about activity, just how much did you move? What were the accelerometers saying? So there's a lot of things that we know how to measure but don't know how to interpret um, that we can collect data about in the course of, of observations. We can start summarizing conversations and some of the sort of meaningful um, patient experience in ways that point back to those activities and we can start to bridge. Uh, I think in the near term, the challenge becomes how do you summarize a free form interview in a quantitative way and actually gather that data? It might be painstaking, but if you can gather a bit of it and say, well, this is the constellation of, of factors that represent the, the kind of thing I want to track, then we can talk about predicting that from the things that we measure all the time. Okay. Uh, another question that's come in from the audience, which is quite a good one, and uh, I thought it would be an appropriate one for uh, Dr. Abernethy and, uh, and Dr. DeVoy, um, and, and possibly Steve, uh, Steve uh, Wiviat as well. Um, one of the last things that the outgoing um, uh, FDA commissioner, Dr. Gottlieb, talked about was the importance of clinical trial improvements and how we're going to do that. And the question was, why was the former FDA commissioner so frustrated with industry around their inability to innovate in clinical trial design? And, and I thought we'd start, start, Michael, with you before okay. turning to okay. a current FDA employee to <laughs> interpret what the former director was thinking. <laughs> so I would not one moment 
think to speak for the thoughts of the former FDA director, but I, I'll speculate. I think the frustration is that we've been very conservative in how we've approached this, and that's understood because of the level of investment we've made and the observation in which we operate, and it's, work, it's worked. The fact that it's extremely expensive, time-consuming, and slow doesn't mean it doesn't work, and we have a model that functions. I think what we're now facing is in a number of areas, we talked about heart failure uh, earlier, for example, is where if we don't find new ways of operating and running clinical trials potentially will deny important therapies for patients and society because our current model in some areas is just now broken. So I think the frustration was why will industry not adopt experiment more with these methods? And I think uh, on the other direction, the positions that uh, Scott Gottlieb took really were encouraging for companies to start to break out of that more conservative approach and try new things. And before we get Amy's answer, Steve, have you, from the academic standpoint, have you seen any progress with industry in terms of their willingness to accept alternative trial designs or to use more real world evidence or AI to help influence their thinking? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have, I've seen some. You know, I think that, that the, the place that, that really is, you know, where the, the really is lacking is in this in the sort of registration pathways stuff that you know that we we're ju just hearing about, which is, and it, and I think ultimately it's really out of fear, mm -hmm. right? You know, you you go, you meet with the FDA, you come up with a plan, and then you go off and you do this experiment. You come back five years later, all the people are different, and if you haven't buckled it down exactly the way it's been done in the past and that you can point to in the past. I think there's fear that, that's, that, that all that work is going to have been done and, and not be accepted. So what's more expensive, a $500,000 trial that, is, you know, that has a good chance of success or a $100,000 trial that's a total, you know, that, that's a total uh, you know, gamble? So I think that it's, a lot of it is just is, is fear that, um, you know, that, that, that when they get to the finish line, the, that the goalposts will have changed. Amy? I, I think that the description that you've just heard is very real. Um, and if we look at Scott's statements, um, that they're very real as well. As FDA, we've tried to think forward about guidances that include how to think about risk-based monitoring, how to um, basically widen eligibility criteria within the context of clinical trials, how to um, start to think about electronic methods, including the <coughs> EHR, but that has to be partnered with industry in particular actually now incorporating that into the work they do. And it's also exactly what Steve just said, which is that as you're contemplating that, you're doing so within the context of the risk of your asset and the risk of the development pathway and the risk that you get to five years later and perhaps that eligibility criteria that you now have um, done away with becomes potentially more important or something else. And, and so I think that right now we're in this important place where we all believe we need to modernize our approach to clinical trials, but we also recognize that it takes movement to be able to see what each other is doing and understand what is an appropriate pathway. Um, you know, I think one of the places this becomes really quite obvious also is in the real world evidence space. And so when FDA put forward the framework in December of 2018, what it basically says isn't here's what the guidances look like right now, but here's our approach to thinking about real world evidence, bring us example projects so that we can now write guidances in response to that. So it's an example of how we're gonna to continue to need to work together with industry to try and keep pushing this forward. Okay, this next question is one I'd like to get everybody's opinion on because I know it's something I've been frustrated by and I bet you it's something everyone's been frustrated by and it's a question asked by by a member of the audience, which is why can't we in healthcare um, have EHR makers, healthcare providers, pharma companies, the FDA, diagnostic testing companies do a better job of standardizing data models so that we can share data? Why has that been so difficult for us to get there? And, and Steve, we'll just start with you and go down the row because I think everyone's got a, a frustration with this and a pretty strong feeling that that's one of the limitations to having AI makes the kind of impact it could. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I guess, you know, why uh, is, a, is a tough question. I think a lot of it comes down to um, competitive models, right? That um, one sponsor, I mean, even, uh, you know, simple things like could we write a protocol that, um, that all look the same? Um, you know, but one sponsor has its template, another sponsor has its template, and so then when you start to get it to the, the FDA to review, they become very, very complicated. So I think a lot of it at, the, at this point is it's competition. If we could all agree on standards, it would be much better. Vicki? I agree. I, I think there's a misalignment between um, the competition, even among, even in the electronic medical record space. I mean, there's, there, there wasn't really an alignment of the business model with open sharing of the data. And um, I think, you know, it's improving as, as the, the, um, situ the, the situation's been raised, but the competitive components of, of this and ownership of data are part of, the, part of the issue in terms of sharing and creating a standard. Plus, I also think it's very complex data. Josh? So I, I spend more time than I would care to admit working in the health data standards world, working with some of the standards development organizations, uh, working with electronic health record vendors, with developers around the world who are you know, thinking about how to share data in a consistent way thinking about how to get semantic interoperability. Uh, and, and the first thing I'll say is actually we've made great strides, right? There are some really nice uh, web standards that are openly available, uh, Creative Commons zero licensed public domain kind of stuff, really great thought work that's gone into it over the last decade. So there, there's a lot of sort of progress to report. Uh, on the other hand though, what I'll say is that at the end of the day, I think we've got not a clinical data interoperability problem, as much as a clinical interoperability problem, which is to say everybody, just, just from the clinician perspective, collects slightly different information from patients in a different way, does their own flavor of a diagnostic workup, takes their own flavor of a history and physical exam. We are literally collecting different information in different ways about everyone. And so to imagine that we'll solve that downstream by then standardizing the data models is honestly a little naive. That's the struggle. Amy? So I was trying to think about what I was going to say, but it turns out I was going to say exactly what you said. <laughs> so I'm going to take it from there. Um, you know, in my prior life, I spent a lot of my life focused on data standards. And um, I've also uh, been in two electronic health record companies and also thought about this from the standpoint of an academic. We studied at Duke um, what would happen if we tried to standardize data entry into electronic health record within the context of a clinical visit, oncology focused. We discovered that in a clinical visit, if you wanted to standardize variables going in, if it was a fellow, you could standardize seven within the oncology visit. If it was a junior attending, you could standardize five. And if it was a senior attending, and essentially any attending over the age of about 45, you could standardize three. Which tells you that you can't get very much standardized within the context of a visit that's gonna answer anything and still get the rest of the work done. And what happens when you try and force it? the person just starts hitting the letter Q to make the, th the screens go forward, so what you end up with is a data quality problem on the other side. So ultimately, we, I, I personally believe, not the words of the FDA, but we need to let doctors be doctors and patients be patients and think about how do we create systems, workflows, and activities around them that either improve data collection and or clean up data on the backside. Mike. So not a lot to add from what I've heard already, but it really resonates what Amy said. I was talking to uh, someone from an academic medical center west of here, and exactly the same frustration and the same feedback. But I think there is a part of this which is back again to the patients and ultimately the ones who are benefiting from this and owning the data. I think they can try and maybe block some of the both vested interests and just um, behavioral patterns that make this more difficult. And, and I think the, the next uh, symposium, or the next panel discussion is gonna be talking about value in healthcare and seeing Tim Ferriss stand over there and thinking about how Tim's thinking about value and collecting data, that that same data collection process is gonna be absolutely crucial to how we think about demonstrating that the treatments that we're providing are adding value to the care that we provide and allow us to be paid and recognized for that value that we present. So I think it's not just an issue with this right now. So I guess I'll ask one other question, which is um, I remember going to visit IBM Watson about three years ago over in Cambridge. And I walked in and they showed me a demonstration. 
I'm a little non-sophisticated when it comes to software. I didn't realize these things were usually staged in advance for <laughs> demonstrations. After reading Bad Blood, I realized that a lot of our industry is staged, um, but not our industry, but other industries. <laughs> and so I went to, I went to uh, IBM Watson, and they said, well, look, Dr. Lynch, look what we're able to do. We can take PDFs, put them into a PDF reader, and IBM Watson can read the PDFs and come out with a diagnosis. Okay, how far away are we from doing that? And was I completely bamboozled? You were gonna make? Oh no, that's for anybody. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think we're, um, I think we're pretty far away from, from some of that. Um, but I was bamboozled. <laughs> per, per, perhaps, yeah. But I mean, there, again, it, de it depends. I think that like, like a good science experiment, you have to ask the right questions, right? So if you, if you say you're gonna take the universe of possible diagnoses and feed it into a machine and you're gonna get an answer, I think that's, that's unlikely. Um, but there are certainly things that we can do. If you want to phenotype a specific illness, you can probably do that more effectively uh, with some of this uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. We, could, we can feed images in, you know, whether it be um, you know, radiographic images or pathologic images, and we can probably get as good or better uh, than we're going to get in a standardized uh, laboratory. But I think that we're, we're a ways away. I'll add to what Steve was saying. You know, ultimately, we can think about this at a variable by variable basis. So that if you feed in the PDF, so to speak, there's some variables that are going to be quite consistent across PDFs that now machines can be used to pull that information out in a consistent way that lines up with a specific concept. However, it's really tough to do across all variables and all concepts. The other thing is that often it is regional or even you know, within a specific health system. So we've seen consistency in defining uh, algorithms that will be able to pull information out of PDFs, for example, within the Va Vanderbilt system, but it didn't translate well to Duke. So often what you see is the idiosyncratic aspects of medicine that happens regionally translates also to what we see in the algorithms. Josh? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll get there eventually. I'm not gonna predict a date for you, but I wanna sort of anchor us to where we are today in 2019 in terms of sort of clinically relevant tasks on free text. This is a, this is a big space and people are doing a lot of exciting things, um, you know, in, including figuring out what research articles are gonna be relevant for a given patient, you know, they're give, given a set of um, genetic testing results, lots of interesting stuff, but a state of the art result today is given a full transcription of a clinical visit, this, this is like a gem article from last month. This, given a full transcription of a clinical visit, all the words that the patient said and that the doctor said, trained on a corpus from a consistent institution, given that, can you predict which symptoms that were mentioned in that transcript the patient actually experienced? Uh, and that's a task we're not doing great at yet. We're not close to human parity on that task. So just given the actual words, including the mention of symptoms, which ones were symptoms that the patient experienced. Yeah, and I just want to say one thing. I'm not seeing anything negative about IBM Watson. I actually think <laughs> I give them a lot of credit for what they're trying to do. And I actually, like Josh, I believe <clears throat> we will get there. Because if you look at the difference between how we're looking at voice recognition now, what voice recognition can do for us, <clears throat> reading, a, reading a printed piece of paper, turning it into a PDF and interpreting it, isn't that insane that you could get to that point. So I, I do agree there's a lot to be done, but it's, it's not something we can't achieve. And I don't mean to say anything negative about equating IBM with Theranos. And I don't have a <laughs> example specifically to answer your question, but I have an analog, I think. So we're in the process of applying AI to our drug safety pharmacovigilance situation. There we get lots of input cases written by doctors, information, it's somewhat structured. And what we did is we chose a vendor by, part of it was setting a test and we gave them 20,000 cases. And they took them away, we'd already classified them. And we, to your point, Amy, we had a spider graph of different, uh, did they classify them right as serious or non-serious, labeled or unlabeled, et cetera, et cetera. And what was interesting was uh, the range of effectiveness of the software but also in a very conservative group of people, as you have in drug safety for good reason, I think already you know, a high level of surprise at what the best algorithms could run on that sort of information. So I think we'll get there. And if we'd done that two years ago, we probably would have got nowhere. But we, are, we saw one company that said, you've given us the wrong sort of cases. 
but a couple of others who are really getting a very high level of quality with that. So now we're down to four minutes. We probably have three quarters of the questions we haven't answered. So what I'd like to do is a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a fast, uh, fast uh, answers here. So one, one person can answer these. Grab them if you think you have a good one. I'd say the one word which is more trendy than AI is blockchain. And so the question was asked by someone in the audience, why not use blockchain to standardize and share data, a perfect application of this technology? Who wants to grab that? I'll, I'll, I'll take the quick take on it. <laughs> Blockchain is a very interesting technology. Anytime you've got a problem of wanting to maintain provenance of information over time, but it's not going to get at the question of how do we model our data and how do we get consistent behavior. Okay, yeah. Vicky, this one might be uh, up your alley. Is there any effort to add patient collected wearables and input data in clinical trials, either to large observational studies or other studies? Yes, lots. I think that's a very exciting um, uh, part where a very exciting part of this uh, real world evidence where, where pharma is actually um, adding those dimensions into their trials and I, I think that will continue. As I mentioned before, I think cross validation uh, between what we're collecting in passive monitoring and what are some of the standard definitions of endpoints or patho yeah. pathology of disease or in clinic assessments still need to be done. We need to do a better job of marrying those. But yes, there's a lot of action around that. Okay. And Mike, this is a question for you. It's a, a pretty tough question to answer. Um, and it's from the audience. How do we balance the need for return on investment and the desire to develop new blockbuster drugs versus the need to develop medicines that will have global impact? Could AI and real world evidence help that, that balancing act between the two so desires? I, I don't see a um, conflict between that. I think what we discussed earlier was we have to find better, smarter, more uh, cost-effective ways of developing and approaching new therapies. That will then make it uh, more accessible for us to then deliver them on a global basis. But I think if we don't solve this conundrum of how much it's costing us to bring new products to market, then we won't even have the therapies to offer. So I'll give uh, the last question to Dr. Abernathy, which is given your career, having been a, an investigator, a clinical investigator, uh, working in the development of, of a company like Flatiron and now being at the FDA, when Chris Coburn is doing this meeting 10 years from now, okay, it'll still be about AI. No, it'll be moving. <laughs> but when Chris is doing Partners Innovation in 10 years, what do you think the biggest change in clinical trials will be? And, and do you think that within 10 years we'll really get to the point where things are, are better, more efficient, and that we fulfill that promise of getting new ideas to patients faster? So two parts to the answer. Um, one aspect that I think is going to be substantially changed in 10 years is we're going to have gone from talking about each of these individual kinds of problems. How do we get the data right to what are some of the use cases where we can apply it to how do we um, incentivize industry to now the soup to nuts of thinking about the use of mathematical approaches across the entire clinical trial supply chain inclusive of how do we get the information back into the clinical space. So that's the first thing I think will be remarkably different in 10 years. The second part that I think is will be remarkably different in 10 years hasn't really come up yet, but is actually reflected by all of us sitting here in the panel, and that's that we're going to have really the expectation that all the different parts of the, ta of the table, all the different parts of the story have to be at the same table solving this problem. And importantly, that means that clinicians and statisticians and AI ex um, experts and software engineers and industry experts are all so solving the problem together, and regulators. And regulators. And I think that's one of the things about oncologists is oncologists, we tend to see things as getting better, and we tend to be optimistic about what the future can hold. Thank you guys very much. It was a real pleasure, and thanks to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.